E-Flight's latest Warbird offering is the third iteration of the 1.2 meter P51D Mustang. It has a new coat of paint, an upgrade that's supposed to give us some options we never had before, and apparently you can have all this ready to rock and roll in less time than it takes to charge a battery. I got a battery charging, so I guess I better get after it. What's up everybody? You're watching Model Aviator. I'm Adam, the 1.2 meter series of Warbirds from E-Flight. Man, this is a popular series of foam Warbirds. They've been around a long time. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to fly literally every one that they ever came out with. There's not a bad flyer in the lot. Some of them have their little idiosyncrasies, but as Warbirds go, they're all pretty easy to fly. Most of them could easily be a first or second Warbird, depending upon the experience you have moving into this horizon hobby says that this is a skill level two airplane some experience required we'll test it we'll tell you what we think it is a full featured six channel warbird so you have obviously three axis control obviously throttle control you've got retractable main gear and functioning flaps the spectrum ar631 receiver that comes standard in the bind and fly which is what we have here is equipped with AS3X and optional safe select. If you choose to use the optional safe select, you're going to want to assign that to a switch and you're going to need a seventh channel to take advantage of that. There's a lot of scale bits on these 1.2 meter warbirds. They're not as scale as your more premium scale warbird like the 1.5 meter E-Flight Mustang. That is a premium scale warbird. It's got everything. Sequencing, main gear doors, retractable tail wheel, LEDs, uh, a scale prop that is close or closer to the scale size of the prop. It just looks like a proper real P51. It is bigger, harder to transport, harder to store. It requires a bit more skill and it has a price point that is well beyond this. These airplanes are intended to be a bit simpler, kind of easy like Sunday morning, easy warbird experience. You just have fun, they look good, they fly awesome, and that's kind of the point. So what did they change in this third iteration? The most obvious change is, of course, the paint scheme. This one is painted up in the 352nd Fighter Group's Cripsa Mighty Third. This is an airplane that was flown by George Preddy. George was America's leading Mustang ace with 27 confirmed kills, or 26.83 if you want to be technical. On multiple occasions, he shot down multiple airplanes in the same mission. Unfortunately, he would not make it to the end of the war. Ironically enough, shot down by friendly ground fire while chasing down a Focke Wolf 190. Very unfortunate, but quite a nice tribute to an American hero and the best fighter pilot to ever fly a Mustang. So the other significant change that isn't quite as obvious is in the ESC. This airplane flies, like the previous version, the June Knight, on 2200 to 3200 3 or 4S packs. However, the June Knight version had a 40 amp speed control that at its outermost was actually rated to somewhere in the 60s as far as amps are concerned. There was some speculation that in really hot, humid weather, with a really good pack that pulls a maximum amount of amps, and a pilot that maybe dogs the airplane and likes to fly at full throttle the whole time, that that could be sketch. The addition of the Avian 70 amp light spectrum ESC has taken that worry away. You can absolutely dog this airplane even when it's hot, even with the best of four cell packs that you can get in the airplane. You don't have to worry about overheating anything or burning anything up, so that's nice. Also, since it's a smart ESC, it provides telemetry. If you have a compatible spectrum transmitter, even with a battery that's not a smart battery, you can get battery voltage and it will warn you when you're approaching low voltage cutoff before you get there and get yourself into trouble. It's kind of a nice feature. If you have a spectrum smart pack in conjunction with this ESC and a compatible spectrum transmitter, you get a lot of other feedback like battery temperature and the amps that you're pulling. So some useful information telemetry wise if you want it. 
when we received our p51 all the parts were in good nick as you might expect everything was packed very very well and it's a very low part count when it comes to assembly that is one of the things that horizon hobby kind of makes a promise on they say on the product sales page that you can have this airplane ready to fly in about the same time or less that it takes to charge a battery that's a little bit subjective i mean let's face it if you're pushing a battery at 5c if you have that ability you might have that thing done in eight minutes other batteries depending on your charger might take two hours <laughs> I allotted 30 minutes. I figured with our resources and my skill level, it shouldn't take me longer than that to program the transmitter and get this airplane ready to go for Maiden and be ready to put it in the truck. It took me 27 minutes. That was pretty much on point. And that's with me not really trying hard, changing out music on my phone. Uh, it's not hard. You start at the back of the airplane. You have a single carbon spar that goes through the vertical the two sides of the horizontals come together one self-tapping screw on either side you have that on when it's time to put the wing on this one doesn't have the automatic plug-ins like some things horizon hobby but that really doesn't exacerbate the assembly very much at all it might be because you have to slip the wing back beyond the radiator and rotate it up and they couldn't get that to line up could be budget based i don't know doesn't matter it adds all of about a minute and a half, two minutes to the build. You have very well marked wires coming out of the wing that are marked gear, flap, aileron. They pass through the only hole in the fuselage. You plug them in the respective spot on the receiver, which it tells you in the manual so you know exactly where and how to plug those in. And then you stow your wires away and you are good to go. And you should have your transmitter pretty much programmed. The manual says two to three rates depending on whether or not you put it on a two or three position switch. You can absolutely do that. We only used one. We knew we wouldn't use the low rate. We also didn't bind it to have the safe select because we knew we wouldn't need it. To each their own, you do it the way you need to do it for you. It doesn't call for any Expo. Obviously, there's Expo built in to the AR-631. I'm not sure how much. We didn't use any Expo, and after flying the airplane, we still don't have any Expo. That worked for us. If you need Expo, dial in however much you need in 5 or 10% increments until you get it where you want it. And a good thing to do on a Maiden, if you're concerned about the Expo, maybe pick a rate that you're going to use and do three rates where it's actually the same rate but different expo numbers with every flip of the switch so you can see what expo number is closest you might hit it right on the button with one of your choices if not you'll know which one's closest and when you land from your maiden you'll know where to go from there it's just a good way to kind of figure the expo out a little faster you want to make sure obviously that the last thing you do is put your propeller on you want your transmitter programmed you want to make sure all that your control surfaces are centered and with propeller off you want to plug the airplane up activate the ESC run the throttle up past 25 percent so that the AS3X is activated and check to make sure that the AS3X is countering the proper way now with the bind and fly airplanes they always are but you still want to check it just to be safe and the way you check it if you don't know how to do that you get in front of the airplane obviously that's safe because you don't have a prop on it yet after you run it up and bring it back to idle and hit your throttle cut with the AS3X activated you simply move the airplane in the direction that you move it and whatever direction that you move, when you move it this way, the rudder should go that way. You move it this way, the elevator should go that way. You move the aileron this way, this aileron should go up. Basically, with you in front of the airplane, if the control surface goes in the direction that you're moving it, then the AS3X is correcting the right way. Once you've done all that, you put your prop on, and you're good to go. Take it to the field and maiden it. Okay, we're going to get the flying. We'll tell you about the flying footage in just a second. Right now, I want to go over something that we ran into, and it's something worthy of mentioning to you. When it comes to the batteries, obviously on the product sales page, it says that it takes 2200 to 3200 3S and 4S packs. And that's true. You can use those, but there is a little bit of a snag that you need to know about. 
The tray comes with these straps. When you strap it down tight, the Velcro on your battery squishes down into these slots and it keeps that from moving. Also, the tongue and the tongue and groove, once you put your battery in the slot, that is positioned right there so it can keep this from coming back. So if that tray were to come loose, it's going to be very difficult for it to overtake the hatch and slide back, so that shouldn't be a problem. The first thing I ran into is with the 2200 milliamp packs, putting this thing in, I couldn't see very well the slot that I needed to put it in. It's, it looks like there's three slots there to me. It's, it's kind of hard to get that thing lined up. I just simply took a Sharpie and marked the slot that I needed to line the tray up with. And since you have some battery hanging off the end, which you're always going to have, and there's plenty of room forward of where the tray stops in the airplane, so that's not a problem. That's where we put it to balance our airplane, where we flew it with a 2200 four cell. This is what we're going to fly the airplane on. We flew it on a 2200 three cell, just to show you what it does on a three cell and show you the difference. But getting the 2200s, any 2200, even our big fat HRB 2200 four cells fit just fine. Plenty of room to use the straps. You would think that you can use the straps with any of the allotted batteries, but as it turns out, even a compact 3200 four cell like this Gen 2 Smart Pack, which is pretty small for a 3200 four cell, the width is exactly the width of the slot. So it will go in there, but you don't have room for the strap on either side of the pack if you're using the 3200 four cell. So what you need to do is take the straps off put Velcro on the tray and just use Velcro. Again, that's going to work fine because it's tight, it's a snug fit, and you have the tongue and the tongue and groove. So it's not going to come loose, you'll be fine. But that could be inconvenient if you want to fly on both. So I suggest that you pick one. Either fly it on the 3200s or fly it on the 2200s and just ride with that because you don't want to have to be taking the straps on and off. That'd be kind of a pain. For what it's worth, we got five minutes easily even flying at high performance on the 2200s, there's not a need for the 3200s. I think the airplane person would be a little bit nose heavy. We didn't fly it on the 3200s because I liked the performance with the 22s and I like the idea of leaving the straps on there and not having to fiddle with that at the field. So we didn't, but you certainly can if you want to use the larger batteries, they will fit. You just have to do a little bit of extra work to make them fit. Now, when it comes to the flying, we tested everything that Horizon Hobby claimed. They said the airplane will do scale-like flying, sport flying, aerobatic flying, and high-speed flying. We're going to do all that and then some. We're going to fly the airplane off a smooth surface as well as grass, so you can see how the airplane handles ground handling-wise there. It's a good bit of flight footage, fun airplane to fly. Check this out. Set up pages next, then the flight footage. When you're done with that, we'll meet you back here and we'll sum it up. Enjoy this. Mustang has a lot of torque and it requires a good bit of rudder to counter that torque. I got a little behind it there on this first takeoff. These are our stall tests. This one is completely dirty, gear and flaps down. The next one will be gear down, flaps up, and then we'll do a completely clean stall. You'll notice in none of them does the airplane drop a wing or show any bad habits? We're going to talk a little bit more about these stalls in the sum up after the flying, but just keep those in mind.
tail is very light and a bit hard to hang on to on the rollout. We'll show you how to do that better in a bit. During our scale flight, the guys in the background with the nail guns were kind of going crazy with those things. We lowered the volume level on this particular flight to try to drown some of that out, so just bear with that. A couple of things that I really appreciate about this Mustang. On 4-cell you have so much power in reserve you can do what I'm doing here which is come into a scale maneuver at a slower scale speed and then power up through the maneuver to emulate the momentum that a full scale plane has that a model typically doesn't have. That's really nice when you've got enough power to do that and the fact that this airplane is smooth. If you're smooth it's smooth and it's very easy to make it look realistic.
So the trick to a straight rollout when the tail comes down is to simply put the flaps up after you touch down. I've found this is easier to do if you assign your flaps to switch B on your transmitter. It's a full speed pass on 3 cell. Pretty good climb rate there. And considering how cold it was this morning, almost freezing, that's not bad performance at all. That's enough to do pretty big orbit maneuvers. I still prefer the airplane on 4 cell, even for scale flying, because I like to be able to come in slower and then power up through big maneuvers. But 3 cell is going to be plenty for a lot of people. This airplane is very, very stable, slow. Here, we're completely dirty, full flaps, gear down, and even steep turns, there's just no bad habits. This airplane has such a wide speed envelope, and when it's slow, it inspires a lot of confidence. So here, clearly, we're throwing scale right out the window. Here's a couple of full deflection rolls. That's high rate or 100% rates. And now we're going to put it in the knife edge and just know this thing will sustain a knife edge until you get bored with it.
So basically the purpose of wrenching it around this way, I'm purposely trying to get this thing into an accelerated or aerodynamic stall, and it wouldn't do it. Yes, I know it's not a cub, but would you believe that Bob Hoover actually used to one wheel a P-51? Well, there you go. As you can see, the 1.2 P51 delivers when it comes to flight performance. Everything that was promised can absolutely be achieved with the airplane. It does fly well on 3S and 4S. 3S is going to be enough power for a lot of people. 4S is probably going to be enough power for anyone. If you want to fly at scale, you just fly it smooth and deliberate. looks very realistic in the air, capable of big warbird maneuvers on both packs, frankly, but obviously you can make them bigger on 4S. When you want to go fast, the thing has a huge speed envelope from absolutely crawling to pretty well cooking. And if you're a sport pilot that likes to throw it around, it has that capability as well. So it really does check all those boxes, to be fair. There's one thing I do want to mention when it comes to the grass operations. As you saw, it did well off grass. It's winter time here in Georgia. We've had a lot of rain, so in the morning when we flew this thing, the ground was very hard and frozen. It very pitted from all the rain. It was shorter grass, but it's rough. I needed the up elevator that the airplane has to be able to negotiate that. And as you saw in the stall test, I don't personally think that those are stalls you're seeing. I think there's not quite enough elevator to get the airplane all the way to critical angle of attack and actually stall it. I think what you're seeing is the airplane at full up elevator power off establish a steep controllable rate of descent and that's why it doesn't drop a wing and go into a spin or anything like you would expect a P-51 to do when it actually stalls. Now there's nothing wrong with that but the point is that's not a ton of up elevator as it is. You will need full rate, what is at 100% offered for grass operations if you're going to fly off grass. So even if you go with the lower rates, you want to either be mindful that you're in high rate for takeoff and landing, or you might want to consider just leaving the elevator in the high rate. And if it feels sensitive to you, compensate with Expo. That way the airplane is going to fly the same all the time, whether you're doing a loop or a roll or you're at a critical part of flight where you could possibly do damage, which is take off and landing. So just something to think about. 
when it comes to the build, obviously they delivered there. You can get the airplane together in the amount of time that they allotted. It's a very, very easy assembly. It's easy to set up. When it comes to downsize, very, very minor stuff. The first thing that I think a lot of people are probably going to mention is, man, it doesn't have LEDs. It, it should have LEDs. Listen, I get it. You're preaching to the choir. I think everything should have LEDs. I think most of us do. And to be fair, Horizon Hobby does as well. Newer molds going forward, it's my understanding that the plan is that the vast majority, if not all, of new molds are going to have LEDs. So they get it. They know what you want. They want that as well. But this is an older mold. And when you have a mold that wasn't intended for LEDs, like the new Carbon Z T28 that they just re-released, that's a very big mold. It's an airplane at a price point where recouping the cost of changing that mold and adding LEDs can be, can be recouped a little bit easier at that price point without people noticing so much than it can with a smaller mold like this. So I think it's just merely a, a budgeting deal. I think that's the reason that some companies don't choose to change a smaller mold that doesn't have it and add that. They're trying to keep the cost down in a economy right now where everything is expensive and kind of crazy. So I get both sides. I get why you want them on everything, but I get why in a case like this with the 1.2 series that they're not doing it. So it just kind of is what it is. The only thing that's really fiddly is the battery tray. We talked about that. To be fair, that is something that Horizon Hobby absolutely owns, and they do it on the product sales page. There is a Flight Talk video there where Jason talks about this, talks about having to remove the straps to use the 3200s. It's only fiddly if you want to go back and forth. The simple solution to make it easy for you is just make a choice. You're going to fly it on 22 or 32. If you do that, it'll be configured the way you need it to be configured, and it will be easy to do every time you do it. It's only difficult if you're going to go back and forth from 2200s to 3200s. And to be fair, if you want to fly 2200s and use the straps like we wanted to do, we got five to six minutes depending on how we flew the airplane, and that was in very cold, right at freezing weather. So good performance even on the smaller packs is what we got. So there it is. So if you decide that you want one of these P-51s, I think it'd be a great airplane as a first warbird for somebody that has a little bit of tail dragger experience and maybe a second warbird for somebody that's past a trainer but doesn't have tail dragger experience yet. You may want to consider maybe the 1.2 T-28 or the Carver Z T-28 as your first warbird and then move into a tail dragger once you get some experience with something like maybe a Cub or a Timber. So the skill level two that they put on this airplane I think is accurate. If you decide you want one of these, it is a laid back, great flying airplane, great warbird experience that is just kind of a no brainer, easy like Sunday morning, easy to fly. Check it out at Horizon Hobby. Go through our link in the description, our affiliate link, you go through there. It gives us a little bit of a commission and helps us fund the channel and we appreciate the support. So. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you next week with something cool with wings. Take care.